I've already said, I never tire of these views. But if you want to see something else to start out this next film, let's move outside and walk down the road to Como a few hundred meters. Behind this impressive gate, which is most certainly not automatic, and relies on low-tech, non-electronic, spiky deterrence at the top to fend off intruders, are the grounds of Villa Gerli. It's sometimes called Villa Trivulzio, but, as I was reliably informed at my hotel, it has been in the property of the Gerli family for decades. You can't see the actual villa from the road, only from the lake as it happens. We'll be taking a look at where this meandering driveway leads to later on in this video. I spent the morning in the sun at the Lido di Bellagio, and by around 1.30 I needed some shade and some food. So upstairs to the restaurant level, where I had an insalata by Bianello, their name for a big bowl of mesclun, apples, walnuts, and brie. Those may not be so-called typical local ingredients, but they made for a very refreshing salad on a hot day. The afternoon was spent in further private sun worshipping on my terrace. The day before, on my pre-aperitivo walk down to Loppia, I passed the gardens of Villa Gerli from another angle. Below them, to be precise, as the road to Loppia tunnels underneath them, with the driveway we saw earlier, which leads to the villa, obscured from sight by the trees. When you come out of the underpass, you are greeted by this splendid orange-red house with pale green shutters, situated directly next to the Gerli property. Down by the water, the sign next to this unassuming gate indicates another entrance to their grounds. I was down in Loppia for a reason, booking a table for dinner two nights later at the Osteria alle Darsene, where you can see the chef and a waiter outside the restaurant in the background. You remember from last season what an extraordinary dinner I had there last year. This year's menu will be coming up soon. Back to the present. The weather had changed, with a strong wind whipping up whitecaps on the lake. As a result, dinner was served indoors on the glass-enclosed veranda. My menu was quickly selected and the waiter made an excellent wine recommendation to go with it. A half bottle of Eitkirch Chardonnay from just south of Bolzano in South Tyrol, from the Schreckbichl winery. The firm is called Colterenzio in Italian, as very few Italians would be able to manage the pronunciation of Schreckbichl. It was a delightful accompaniment to my dinner which started off with a plate of sliced colatello, served with a little bowl of fruit mostarda, whose sweet spicy mustard flavor is a perfect pairing with salumi-like colatello. A new primo at Silvio's this year were the black tagliatelle with mesoltini. This was a very successful new menu item not just because I didn't order any mistletini by themselves as an antipasto this trip. For more information on mistletini, you might want to refer to episode 5 from my second season. Skipping a secondo after the delicious and abundant portion of tagliatelle, I headed straight for dessert. While chocolate mousse is hardly a rarely encountered dessert, Silvio's is particularly good. And it's made from extra dark chocolate, so it's extra appealing to a chocoholic like me. Instead of having a dessert wine to go with the mousse, I decided to order something afterwards, which I thought would be a nice follow-on an arcane Extra Roma Grand Amber Rum from Mauritius. 
This was my first rum from Mauritius, or for that matter, anywhere outside of the Caribbean. It was definitely the right call.